what makes a good dungeon? When we think about Dungeons and Dragons, dungeons are a staple of the game. They're in the name after all, and they've been there for a long time. I would argue that there are far more dungeons than there are dragons in most campaigns or games that are played at the table. But what makes a good dungeon? How do we know when we've played in a fun dungeon rather than one that's kind of a dud or just sort of boring. I've given it a lot of thought recently as I'm currently working on designing a new dungeon for my campaign and I wanted to design one that was sort of thoughtful and interesting to my players but also interesting to me as a game master to run. Hi, welcome back aboard the Earthmote. I am Randall and today we are talking about all things dungeon design. As I thought a little bit more about it when I was sort of designing this dungeon, I came up with sort of 10 things that comprise the ingredients of a good dungeon design, at least to me personally. And I realized I could kind of classify them into two groups that we're gonna talk about here today. First, we have the conceptual elements. These are the elements that we sort of think about when we're designing and planning the dungeon ahead of time. They really sort of help inform choices that we make about the dungeon. And then secondly, we have the tangible elements. These are much more the physical elements of your dungeon that your players get to interact with and play with at the game table and as they explore your dungeon. So without wasting any more time, let's go ahead and get into the 10 ingredients that can make up good dungeons. We'll start with the conceptual ingredients first on the list because these are the items that we sort of have to think about ahead of time before we really start to design the physical ingredients on our list. First up, we got theme. Theme is sort of what is your dungeon about? Themes don't have to be too in depth, but it's essentially informing us about how you're going to go about designing and choosing which elements you're going to put inside your dungeon. Let's say you have a crypt. Well, your dungeon is probably about the death of a figure or figures that were important enough to have a whole dungeon made after them. So we have sort of this death element to play with along with sort of a important historical figure. Then we can sort of layer on top of that. Let's say it's the tomb of a frost mage. Okay, well now you know that you have sort of this ice, snow, winter type theme going on top of your death element and important figure element. So maybe you have whites in the dungeon, or maybe there's an ice elemental that protects the mage's earthly possessions. It just really sort of informs these choices and kind of helps give you a lot more context to work with, and it sort of helps restrict your focus, which for me is a good thing. Less choice or restricted choice, rather, really helps me kind of narrow in on how I want to design the dungeon and what elements I should be thinking about. I really like uh, Worlds Without Numbers Ruin Tag system for creating themes for your different dungeons. Uh, if you don't have one in mind, he, there's a table where you can roll on some different tags and it gives you some different combinations on what might be the theme or what might be contained within your dungeon. And it just sort of helps you narrow that focus and really uh, get your wheels turning right off the bat. Highly recommend it if you're trying to build a dungeon from scratch without any idea of what's going on inside there. Okay, the second ingredient maybe isn't necessary for all dungeons. It depends on if it's a one shot or if you're running a campaign. But if you're running a campaign, I like to think about how does that dungeon fit within my greater campaign? How does it connect to the rest of my setting? What's there? Why is it there? Why is this dungeon an important place within the setting? And why would my players want to go to that dungeon? And what other factions would also be interested in that dungeon? If you answer these questions, you start to make connections from the elements within your dungeon to the greater world. For me, this is about giving your players information. You can essentially add lore to your setting, but not in a boring lore dump fashion. You sort of let them see different paintings or carvings depicting old battles or political events. 
maybe let them find letters or notes from a time past adding context to the dungeon along with history to the greater setting around them. One way I really like to think about this is different adventure hooks. What hooks can I create that seed adventure to this dungeon? Essentially, what makes my players want to be interested in going to explore that dungeon? What treasure is there? What valuable information is there? Why would they want to go there? Then once they are in the dungeon, what information and hooks can my can I include inside that dungeon that point to areas in the greater campaign setting? This lets the players not only find hooks that drive them to that place, but also drives them to other places in your setting. Sometimes you hear complaints about sandboxes being sort of aimless for players. They don't really have any goals or ambitions. Well, what you should be doing is dropping hints and seeds and hooks within their current areas of exploration to other areas of exploration. That way they're going to have plenty of things to do, plenty of different things to check out, and they might be interested in doing so. And remember, your hooks can be a lot of different things. It can be journal entries or inscriptions on the wall. It could be a treasure map pointing somewhere else could be a piece of treasure or magic item that has a clear connection to another area in the setting. It could be an NPC or something like that within the dungeon. Maybe it's a ghost and it needs the players to do something for them in the greater world to finally put it to rest. Lots of different ways to add hooks into your dungeon and lots of ways to add hooks from your dungeon to the wider world. Conceptually, your dungeon should have conflict in it. Conflict is what drives tension and action at our game tables. There should be some element of conflict inside your dungeon. Depending on how big your dungeon is, you can simplify or complicate the levels of conflict. If your dungeon is big enough to have multiple factions living in it, make them oppose and hate one another. Maybe they have opposing goals or they want the same territory or the same things out of the dungeon. If it's a smaller dungeon, maybe it's just a single individual against another individual. Maybe your conflict has nothing to do with factions or NPCs at all, but maybe it's rather a race against time. Maybe your players go into a dungeon that has a doorway that is only open during a full moon. If they don't get out by sunrise, they'll be trapped in the dungeon until the next full moon. Or maybe it's a conflict against environment. Perhaps your dungeon is in a high mountain pass, and if they don't get to the dungeon and get out before winter sets in, they won't be able to reach the dungeon as the snows block the pass, and they'll be either trapped at the dungeon or unable to access it until spring or summertime when the snows finally clear. A lot of different ways to add conflict and sort of really drive the tension and sort of upbeats within your dungeons. The last conceptual idea I really like to think about is sort of the trade-off of risks and rewards. Your dungeon, of course, should have rewards in it, treasure or information. That's what motivates your players to explore them in the first place. So to some extent, we need to think about the risk that is involved with each of these different rewards that you can find within the dungeon. Sometimes it's fun to have very valuable items in the dungeon with very high levels of risk associated with it, like a staff of power at the end of a corridor rigged with magic wards and traps. If they want to risk it, then they'll earn the high reward. I think it's a good idea to have different areas in the dungeons with different levels of risk and reward associated with it. That way your players can choose what they think is an acceptable level of risk to them while avoiding the more dangerous parts, at least until they're ready. And that's a great way to make your dungeon have more staying power within your campaign. Maybe your party doesn't want to risk the murder corridor that holds the staff of power right now. But when they have more magical ability to dispel magic, they'll come back and take it on. Of course, you get to think about how the dungeon has changed from when they were a party of level ones to a party of level fives coming back to explore the dungeon in all that time that has lapsed between those two periods. Speaking of rewards, if you're enjoying this video, 
giving it a like and consider subscribing to the channel would be a really nice reward to me. It helps more people find my content and makes me motivated to make more videos like these in the future. Now that we have the conceptual items covered, we can start to look at the tangible elements, the physical elements of our dungeon design. How you lay out your dungeon matters to the choices that your players can make within it. Most importantly is the idea of creating looping pathways through your dungeon, sometimes known as jaquazing the dungeon after famous game designer Janelle Jaquaze, who sadly passed away earlier this year. The idea essentially boils down to the fact that your players should have multiple routes to move through the dungeon to different areas inside the dungeon. This allows your players to have choices on how they want to explore your dungeon. They may know that one area is home to a group of troglodytes and they want to bypass them. So they choose to take the other pathway and hope that they avoid the troglodytes this time. If you only have a single pathway running through your dungeon, you are essentially forcing your players and forcing their hand on what they see and do as they go through your dungeon. They lack any real choice in their exploration and it feels more like an amusement park ride rather than exploring an unknown area. You should also include multiple egresses into the dungeon and you should include multiple egresses to different levels of your dungeon if it has more than a single level to it. And not every egress has to go linearly. Maybe they find a long stairway that leads straight from level one down to level three. That's fine and it gives a lot of different interesting options for the players to use and utilize as they explore the area. While looping is probably the most important part of the dungeon layout, you also want to consider how the layout can create advantages and disadvantages depending on how the party and the monsters use the different areas of the dungeon. Things like verticality within a single dungeon level or choke points that different people can take advantage of to fight off or defend against other factions. Speaking of fighting, I think it's a good thing to include things to fight within your dungeon design. D&D does have a large combat component to it after all, and I've found that most parties I've played with do enjoy some combat within the game or within a game session, despite it being sometimes very high risk or high stakes for the player's characters. Of course, don't make everything immediately hostile to the party. But if the party does find themselves in trouble with locals, maybe it's time to roll some dice. Monsters can and should be of differing difficulties and group sizes. This lets your players decide what sort of challenges they want to take on if they can scout them ahead of time. And it also introduces variety into the dungeon so it's not just sort of a monotonous group of orcs here and a group of orcs there. You should also have monsters or elements that let your players role play and socialize within the dungeon. Sometimes the hack fest can be fun, but it's nice to also have those elements that change the pace as they explore the dungeon. Naturally, you can have more friendly faces like a lost adventurer or a group of pilgrims, but you can get a bit weirder too. Maybe there's a talking portrait or a mystical pool that answers questions to the one who bathes in it. Different things that your players can interact with really add that sort of social element. When you're letting your players socialize within the dungeon, they can learn information about it and they can start to piece together different factions or conflicts that are occurring within the dungeon. And that enables them to make more choices as they continue to explore through your dungeon. We've talked about things to fight in the dungeon. Well, monsters often guard treasure. Yes, of course, your dungeon should have treasure in it. This is what your players' characters are risking their lives for in the first place. If you're playing an OSR style game with gold for XP, well, this is your player's ticket to advancing in level and power. So yes, you're gonna need treasure in your dungeon. When I say treasure, I mean this to encompass anything that is valuable to the players. Gold, magic items, potions, even information. Anything that's giving your players an advantage is treasure. And if you have the time, make your treasure cool. Give it some thought. 
while a plus one sword is mechanically good for a fighter, it's fictionally not that interesting. What if you instead gave them the Crimson Cackler, a plus one sword that laughs so maniacally when wielded in battle it unnerves your opponents, forcing them to make morale checks with a penalty? That's a bit more flavorful. That's a bit more cool. It gets your players really engaged with the treasure and the items a lot more than just sort of a mundane plus one sword. Empty rooms and mundane rooms are, well, they're just not that interesting. Every now and then they're nice to give your players a bit of reprieve, but your dungeon should be filled with stuff. I'm calling this interactive elements, but I essentially mean make sure that you have a good amount of items that your players can interact with, mess with, and obstacles they can try to overcome. I'm talking about things like traps, tricks, hazards, puzzles, and so on. There should be levers to pull, magic statues to talk to, tunnels to collapse, chemicals to mix. You get the idea. Give them things to play with and utilize within the dungeon when they're dealing with other monsters or factions in the dungeon. Your players are exploring a dungeon to uncover its wonders and treasures, so make sure they have wonders to play with rather than going from one mundane room to a room filled with three skeletons inside it. The last item on our list is secrets. I love to include lots of secrets in my dungeons. Secret doors that open to hidden treasure vaults or hidden rooms or secret doors that grant the players additional paths through the dungeon to other parts of the dungeon. Your secrets can be big or small. You can have secret treasure containers or secret spots that hold critical information or maybe keys to access other locked areas of the dungeon. I think your players feel clever and they get a sense of accomplishment from finding secrets within your dungeon. So I say put a lot of them in so your players have a chance of finding some of them and really sort of enjoying that aspect of the dungeon. So that's my take on the 10 most important ingredients for making a memorable dungeon. I'm sure I'll expand on some of these in future videos because there is plenty more to say about each of them. But let me know if you think I missed any or if you disagree on any of them. And if you enjoyed the video, give it a like and subscribe for more content like this in the future. Thanks for watching and I will see you back on the Earth Mode soon.